It's just coming up to 25 minutes to midnight, and it's time now for the Schubert essay. Tonight, the novelist Claire Morale imagines what might have happened during one of Schubert's meetings with his great hero, Beethoven. Unable to attend performance, too ill to travel. I sign my name on the bottom of the note that I've just scrawled to Carl Czerny, my old pupil, Ludwig van Beethoven. March the 20th, 1827, Vienna. Anton Schindler, the ghastly, ghostly creature who hovers round me like a goo bottle, takes away the note to have it delivered and returns with a bowl of broth, revolting, nauseating mush. I'm desperate for a drink, but my doctors have forbidden it. More operations, no alcohol. I'm inclined to dismiss the lot of them. Schindler is saying something, over-articulating as usual, but I'm not prepared to waste time trying to interpret the movement of his lips today, so I hold out my conversation book. He dislikes writing anything down, afraid I'll add a derogatory remark next to his entry just to annoy him. I've seen the gleam in his eye when each book is completed. He whisks it away, saving it for his future biography, and produces another pristine version in a matter of seconds. Got them all squirrelled away somewhere, haven't you, Schindler, I say to him relishing the look of perplexity on his long, gloomy face as he pretends to not understand me. I suspect he tears out the pages where I've written rude comments about him. But I don't care. Not really. When I'm gone, my music will be my legacy. That's all that matters. And Schindler wouldn't argue with that. He believes in my greatness. He eventually takes the pen and scribbles two words in the book. Franz Schubert. Is he here? I ask. He nods. Well, well. He'd better go and check he's still waiting, I say. Last time he ran away before we actually made contact. Courage is not a quality that comes naturally to him. I've seen some of Franz Schubert's manuscripts, read through a couple of his early symphonies, and a selection of songs which Schindler bought me a few months ago. To divert me, he said. Is Schubert as gifted as some are saying? The work I have seen is promising, with an enviable grasp of melody, but I can detect my influence on his work. He's competent, like several of my former pupils, but does he have that extra spark, the rare flame of divine inspiration that can be described as genius? My friends pressed me to name a successor, someone I could trust to continue my journey and explore new paths, but no one moves me enough. I refuse to give my approval to a composer who is merely adequate. And anyway, what kind of man cannot find the courage to approach his hero if what they tell me is true and that is what I am to him? How can we be strangers when we both live in Vienna? A few years ago he bought a piano duet he dedicated to me, variations on a French song. But he left before I could set eyes on him. Am I so terrifying that he can't meet me face to face? Ah! A particularly violent pain grips my stomach and I push away the broth, spilling it on my bed cover. Here comes the reptilian Schindler, removing the bowl from my grasp, mopping up the spilt liquid. I allow him to get on with it. If I am to meet the elusive Franz Schubert, I must be dignified. Schindler ushers in Anselm Huttenbrenner and a small, chubby man, Schubert, presumably. I am pleased to see Anselm a charming man of great wit, who claims to be a composer but does not possess the true hunger of a creative mind. How can a man be expected to search his soul for greatness when he is rich and works in a government office? Schubert, unsuccessfully hiding behind Anselm, has curly hair and a tall, domed forehead. He is peering round the room through round, metal-rimmed glasses, his head slightly tilted, as if he is struggling to see. His nickname is apparently Schwemmel, Little mushroom. It suits him. Welcome to Alte Schwarzbania House, I say. The old house of the black-robed Spaniard. The name pleases me. I would write an opera about the sinister Spaniard, but nobody has written a libretto, and I am running out of time. Bring them chairs, I say to Schindler. I reach out to greet Franz, and he grasps my hands firmly. My fingers, where the blood can no longer reach, are icy. His are burning. Is the last of my life ebbing away into him, 
or is he attempting to revive me? He's trying to speak. Someone needs to point out to him that I'm deaf. The conversation book, I say, waving at Schindler, who, dripping with sycophancy, hands him the book and explains the situation. Schubert nods eagerly, almost snatching the book and pen from him, and starts scribbling. His first words are disappointing. I was in the audience on May the 7th, 1824, for your Ninth Symphony. It was one of the most moving experiences of my life. Everyone says this. Isn't he supposed to be original? Thank you, I say. I have found that this is the simplest way to acknowledge praise. People want more from me, but I never know what, so I allow them to continue with their homage until they run out of words, which I can't hear anyway. At the time, I felt there was nothing else for us to write. I am familiar with that fear. There are always new ideas, I say. I am working on a tenth symphony. His eyes are shining feverishly and he nods several times. The world will be holding its breath. Anselm leans forward and writes, I have in my possession two movements of one of France's symphonies. I think you would find them interesting. Only two? Schubert's glasses are misting over. I meant to finish it, but another symphony was distracting me. I intend to return to it. Bring it, I say. We should discuss it. I would be honoured. Anselm writes something else. The next one, his ninth, is magnificent. Has it been performed? Schubert blushes. It seems that neither of us can hear our own work, he writes. I can't afford to have it performed. Ha! The usual problem. The public love our music, but they're not always prepared to pay for it. At least they appreciate your genius. Indignation floods through me. I think not. My last string quartets have been described as indecipherable, uncorrected horrors. The public are not ready for my music. They're fools, he writes. Those quartets fill me with profound joy. A thin layer of sweat covers his face, as if he has a fever. Are you ill? I ask him. Merely exhilarated at being in your presence, he writes. Schindler, I call. He comes sidling up, his face creased into an obsequious smile. I loathe the man, even as I depend on him. Some wine for my guests. Schindler glides away. He'll remember everything about this first meeting with Schubert and put it into the biography. I know how his mind works. I'm seized by a blast of cold, a surge of pain. Anselm, I say, take Franz away and bring him back tomorrow. Anselm rises immediately, responsive to the limits of my health. Schubert stumbles unsteadily to his feet, trying to say something, but the conversation book is in my hand, so he has no alternative but to bow deeply and follow his friend out of the room. When Schindler returns with the wine and sees that they are leaving, he follows them back out. Schindler, I yell, bring me that wine! Later that day, Anselm delivers some of Schubert's music. Not the unfinished symphony, or the ninth, but the beginning of a song cycle. Winterreise, a setting of poems by Muller. I study them cautiously, with an unwillingness to believe in him. The truth is that I approach all music written by younger composers with trepidation. Am I afraid, unwilling to admit that I could be overtaken by a fresh new mind? The world is perpetually searching for new heroes. Does Schubert want to be anointed as my successor? Does he possess the clarity of thought, the vision, the passion to justify a blessing? Winterreiser is astonishing. The music is as bleak as the poems, but the authenticity of the narrator's despair avoids all sentimentality. The naivety of the words is echoed by the music, simple but clever. The piano is used in a most unusual way, almost as a second voice, slipping into unexpected keys that should be unrelated but somehow are not. Repeated chords create an atmosphere of profound sadness. Notes fall like frozen tears. Major keys are even more melancholy than the minor, as they provide the sharp sweetness of nostalgia, while ice and snow permeate every phrase. The barren landscape pushes itself into my room, into my heart, my stomach, touches the rottenness inside me, 
and beckons me to my own winter's journey. Schubert must be barely thirty, and yet this is the mature work of a master. He returns and sits before me waiting for a verdict. His nervousness is manifested by one foot crossed over the other, jerking compulsively into the air, but I see something else in him, a secret joy. He knows, I think, he knows that he has produced a masterpiece. My songs are dark, he writes. You do not have to apologise to me for darkness, I say. My world is as dark as anything else you will find on this earth. He is not afraid to fly too close to the sun. Schindler, I shout. Franz's head shoots up. Schindler appears in front of me as if he's glided in on wheels. Where was he hiding? Why did I not see him skulking in the background, listening to every word? His face is without expression as he waits for my instructions. I wish you to bear witness, I say. The two of them stare at me. I am enjoying my moment of drama. You see this young man, I say, pointing at Franz Schubert. Schindler nods. Bow to him, I say. He is my true successor. Schubert's face lights up with delight. The heat of his excitement pulsates into the room, but it cannot reach the coldness of the pain in my stomach. I am suddenly, unutterably exhausted. I wave my hands at the two of them. Go, go, I'm too tired. Another time, Franz, and we'll talk more. A blast of cold air sweeps briefly from the antechamber into my room as Schubert leaves. I shiver. My bones brittle with the ache of sickness. Looking down at the street from my window, I see a small, round figure emerge from my house and gaze up at the sky with an expression of wonder. It starts to snow. Claire Morale on Schubert and Beethoven in the essay.